Joining me right now is the author of a very interesting book. It's called Paradise General, Driving the Surge at a Combat Hospital in Iraq. We're joined by Dr. Dave Nida, who uh, served over in Iraq. And uh, this book tells the story of what it's like. Uh, uh, some uh, difficult times, obviously, and also some humor as well. We're going to talk to him right now by telephone. And, uh, Doctor, uh, thanks for being with us today. How are you? Thank you for having me. Enjoyed reading through the book. Uh, my mom was a nurse, and uh, I've heard her uh, great stories of her uh, experiences working in accident rooms and in hospitals, and I uh, enjoyed reading uh, your story. I know it was a difficult one to tell, I'm sure, but uh, very rewarding, I'm sure, that you went through it, right? I'll think about this. I'm a 48-year-old guy who decides that he's going to join the Army. I've lived a comfortable civilian life as a family practitioner for decades. And then in 2004, when most people are retiring from the military at age 48, I join the military and I go over to Iraq and wound up serving two tours of duty while in Iraq. It was something that I, I saw things that you never read about in the newspaper, things you never saw on TV. It certainly was different looking at a war through the eyes of someone who's in their late 40s and uh, early 50s as I was as I went through my tours of duty. Yeah, I know you talk about uh, you have to go through some sort of basic training, and even that was uh, was different than you expected. And of course, uh, working in, in a military hospital like that, you see injuries, obviously, you don't see very often in, in an emergency room. So that must have been uh, kind of a shock for you, even though you had, what, 20 years of practice as a doctor already. Well, the basic training part of it was actually kind of funny because I showed up at uh, basic training and had a, I'm 48 years old, I got a 23-year-old in my face screaming at me because I got a loose <laughs> thread on my uniform and I'm trying to figure out what the deal is with that. But, you know, going over to Iraq and working, you're right. The It, it was such a shock to the system because the wounds that you saw were so different than anything you saw in the United States. There was no way that you possibly could prepare for that. Fortunately, I was with a group of seven other doctors, reservists like myself, people that you would go see uh, for whatever medical needs that you have, uh, your, your neighborhood orthopedist, your general surgeon. These are people we were just pulled out of a computerized hat, put together, sent over to Iraq together we had never met, and asked to take care of the wounded together, work together, and make sure that we did the best that we could. Our save rate at our hospital was 98%, and that's because of the civilian skills these doctors and the staff of reservists brought over with them. It's amazing when you, you describe some of the injuries you, you're dealing with. Uh, obviously, a lot to do with uh, bullet shrapnel or explosive devices over there. You're, you're just trying to, I guess, you know, try and stop the bleeding first, and then you're attaching limbs. I mean, it had to be pretty crazy uh, when you first went in there. I guess after a while, and I guess you never get used to it, but you, you sort of developed a sort of a, a calmness about yourself, don't you? Well, I learned in the emergency room when we would have a group of soldiers come in, and I would be running the emergency room that. I needed calm. I needed quiet. You know, you watch a TV show of an emergency room and everybody's screaming and yelling. That never took place when I worked because if it wasn't calm, we would all fall apart very quickly, especially myself. And so it was very important, no matter what kind of wounds you saw, whatever came in, you needed to be calm so that you wouldn't miss anything. And when I say you don't miss anything, you know, you have a soldier come in who's had a, a, a horrific injury, say he has a leg blown off. It's easy to look at that and be horrified and not do a good exam and to miss the small little microscopic piece of shrapnel that went into, let's say, his back mm -hmm. and hit a vital organ. You had to keep your head. You had to do a thorough job. You had to do a complete job because if you made a mistake, you had a young soldier who wouldn't make it, and then there would be loved ones at home who would have an empty room and an empty place in their heart because you made a mistake. Along with uh, you know the horror that you're seeing, uh, uh, there is humor in the book as well. I mean, you almost have to have that, I guess, like like the movie Mash, like the TV series, although that wasn't quite like the movie, but uh, you, there was humor at the time. You needed that as a kind of a release valve, didn't you? We wouldn't have survived if we didn't have humor. Now, certainly we didn't drink martinis like <laughs> the after, uh, after a long day in the operating room, but we, you know, we had our rooftop parties. We ran around in hula skirts, and we put on the nurses' uniforms, and we did this, that. We uh, decided that we would liberate a 
a general Humvee because we were getting tired of walking, but we, we <laughs> got away with it. And the reason we got away with it because I think they looked at us and they said, you know, you guys are just a bunch of stupid doctors. And that was fine because we were there to, 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 to work on soldiers. And uh, all right, so maybe we weren't the best soldiers ourselves. We didn't know how to salute. We would wave rather than salute. But as long as we did our job and we got those kids home, that's what mattered the most. And when you did come back to uh, to the States, uh, as obviously the HESPA made you a better doctor in, in some respects uh, with what you're doing today, right? It's interesting how when I did come back, you know, I do a lot of family practice, and so you see a lot of sprained ankles, sore throats, uh, coughs, colds, things like that. I literally got dropped from Iraq back into the United States and went to work a week later. And seeing things like cold, sore throat, sprained ankles, I couldn't do it for a while. I, I didn't care, which was a terrible way to feel after seeing and working in a, in a combat environment. And then over time, you begin to fall back into that non-adrenaline mode, and you become, a, I'm a much more sensitive doctor than I ever was. So it's never too late. You're never too old to learn new things and change and become better. So you did go through uh, what a lot of soldiers go through, some kind of a, adjustment there, didn't you, after seeing all this, right? Oh, it was terrible. You know, when I came back, especially after my first deployment, I slept on the floor for a month because that's what I did uh, when I was gone. I'd sleep on the ground or sleep on some hard surface. Uh, when, we would, uh, when I would be driving down the road, you would uh, you'd, you'd, you'd zip in an underpass and come out a different lane because when we were over there, the insurgents would drop uh, bombs and explosives on the vehicles as they went under underpasses. So I was a crazy driver for a while. <laughs> there is an adjustment, and the important thing for people to understand is that we need to remember that soldiers come back and need some assistance. They need to decompress, and I especially do have a lot of worry about the reservists who do come back because we're thrown back into the real world right away. We don't live on an army base. We're put back in our homes and then told to, okay, go back to work. Thank you for your service, which is okay, but we do need to make sure that we do make that adjustment back to civilian life. I really do think that, that, that probably the, the most important message, at least I got from the book, and I think the, the readers that, that do pick it up will, will get that. Uh, it's an important story. It, it's a scary story in some respects, but great work being done by uh, people like yourself who uh, volunteered to go over there. And uh, it's called Paradise General. We'll be talking with Dr. Dave Nida. Dave, do you have a website you want to direct people to to get more information about you or the book? Dave Nida. Dot com. Uh, we'll get you information on the book, and we also have a Facebook page for Facebook users called Paradise General, and uh, it's got a lot of pictures of the camp. It's got some video. It's got everything that you'd want to see, and I'll tell you, it is like watching an episode of MASH. <laughs> well, Doctor, it's been a pleasure to talk for a few minutes. Uh, again, uh, thank you for your service, because uh, I'm sure a lot of families that may not have uh, met you or, or heard of you uh, now will get a chance to win this book, and we hope to talk to you again. Thanks for being with us today. Thanks for having me.